I want to look at two passages of Scripture for a little while with you this evening. Both of them have to do with teachers. And to remind ourselves that a teacher is someone who imparts knowledge to others about certain matters. And our interest, of course, is the impartation of Bible knowledge and things related thereto, but especially the Scriptures and what they teach. I want you to look with me, if you will, please, to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. <clears throat> I want us to begin reading in verse 12. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. The strong meat belong to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. If you look at this, you'll see that this or these remarks actually come because he said, I want you to know some things. And if you look at verse 11, he'll say, of whom we have many things to say. And hard to be uttered. Why? Seeing ye are dull of hearing. And then he launches into this business for when for the time you ought to be teachers. You have need again that one teach you the first principles of the oracles of God. In this case, brethren, if you look at the whole letter, Jews who had believed the gospel of Christ obeyed it. Members of the Lord's church, due to persecution, were actually considering leaving the whole New Testament system. And he's in the midst of discussing all of this material. And he says, I have many things to say, but you're dull of hearing. Well, did that mean they had hearing problems? Not in the sense that maybe their ears didn't work right, but in the sense of understanding. And thus he says, you ought to be teachers because you've had enough time. If you had used it correctly, you could. Because none of us teach what we don't know. It's the impossibility to teach that which you don't know. But now here he's saying, in view of the period of time you've spent as Christians, you ought to be teachers. In reality, what are we having to do? We're trying to leave you alone just to keep you faithful. When really you ought to be doing what I'm doing. You ought to be teaching others. Now hold all of that. There he says, you ought to be teachers in view of the time you've been in the church. But then James wrote some of these same people. Just the next letter later. And James had this to say concerning teachers. King James uses the word masters. But it's like the old schoolmaster. He meant a teacher. In James chapter 3. My brethren. I know he's talking about. He's not saying non-members. He's saying my brethren in Christ. My brethren. Be not many masters or teachers. Knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Well that's rather interesting. Holy Spirit, through the rite of Hebrews, says you've had enough time to use it right. You ought to be teachers. And over here, he says, not many of you ought to be teachers. Well, that's rather interesting. It may tell us a lot about how we don't put a lot of emphasis on being prepared to know what you're talking about. If that's not the case in the writer of Hebrews, what would you have to write to say otherwise? Or to say the same thing? And in this case, many times we study these words after verse 1 of James chapter 3 to talk about tailbearing and gossip and backbiting. Well, it certainly is covered by misuse of the tongue, which he makes very clear uh, no man can tame. 
But the context in the use of the tongue, tongue is not gossip and talebearing. The context is teaching. That's the very point in verse 1. My brethren, don't many of you be teachers. Why? Because you're going to receive stricter judgment. I don't mind telling you that since I was somebody as a teenager and thought about teaching, this verse has been somewhat frightening to me. I think it was meant to be frightening to people who put themselves into a position of imparting God's Word to other people. Because you are to do just that. Not your opinions. Not what you heard somebody say and you thought a lot of that person and so you repeated them. But it's the teaching of the Bible. Now how are you going to teach the Word of God if you can't write by the Word of Truth, 2 Timothy 2.15? How, how are you going to really teach like you ought to when you may not even be able to uh, recite the names of the New Testament? My buddies had knee surgery. Ken's had heart surgery. Don't you think that they wanted their surgeons to know the bones of the knee in the case of buddy and know where the arteries are in the case of the heart? Maybe a little more than that. Yeah, but look how serious that is. It's nowhere nearly as serious as teaching the Bible because you're dealing with going to hell or going to heaven here. And if you teach it wrong, you can lead somebody right down the wrong way because how much is said in this Bible about false doctrine and false teachers and being opposed to both and being cautious and careful and circumspect, spending much time in your own study, having an honest and good heart, so much is said, isn't it? So you've got one passage over here saying, now you folks have had enough time as members of the church you ought to be able to teach other people, but you're not. And in fact, you're not even understanding some things because you haven't been using the Bible over the years to discern both good and evil. And that's what you do with the Bible. You know and you know how to discern what's right and wrong, what's good and evil. And they couldn't do it. On the other hand, you've got people up here evidently <laughs> wanting to teach, but they didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> They didn't have the knowledge that they needed. So, my brethren, be not many teachers, knowing we shall receive the greater condemnation, the greater judgment. Because we're saying, this is the Word of God. You must believe and do it. But what if you're wrong in what you're teaching? Had an interesting situation happen yesterday. Of course, I guess somebody knew I'd be speaking tonight, and I needed an illustration. <laughs> we were standing in line to vote and uh, we had gotten in in the line to where the poll workers were and there was quite a few people behind us and uh, I wasn't really paying much attention to anything until I heard the poll worker who was I guess from oh it wasn't as far as me to buddy down here but at least in front of the chair or a little further I don't know exactly she just spoke up of course, people just didn't live it. Nobody was real loud. Nobody was angry or anything like that. And she just spoke up to somebody in the line and said, that's not right. And I heard her and I looked to see what was going on. It wasn't any earth-shattering thing. She just said to somebody, that's not right. And the lady in line said, well, that's what I heard because she was busy telling somebody else what the poll worker said wasn't right. And it was on the... Uh, primary voting matters in the state of Texas and she was telling her something that wasn't right and so the lady said it wasn't right and the lady said well I heard this and she said well that's not correct and she began to give a little lecture on, on the whole voting situation which it was all very peaceful like but, but I was thinking now what if I had been here or some other member of the Lord's church who's faithful and somebody had said something contrary to the word of God and I said, that's not right. Let me show you what the Bible actually teaches. How would that go over? 
Well, with some people, it would go over all right, but you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Jesus did it a few times. It didn't go over too well with some of those folks that consider themselves uh, great spiritual people when they were not. But it tells us that you, you want to be right. And here on that situation, someone was telling somebody else what this person who was in the know knew wasn't right. She spoke up and corrected them. Well, do you think the church is put here on earth to do anything like that at all? When we're called on and charged by God himself to preach the gospel to every creature, we have to know what the gospel is. We spend all day Saturday studying about the gospel. And we learn all these things about it, the first principles and so forth. Well, what are we supposed to do with all that? It must be imparted to other people. Yet here I've got a passage that says, My brethren, be not many teachers. Why? Knowing we, teachers, will receive the stricter judgment, as one translation says, the greater condemnation. What's he trying to do in James 3 that he wasn't trying to do in the Hebrews epistle and those comments? He's trying to say, don't get up and teach till you know what you're talking about. If we don't watch out in the church sometimes, well, I've got somebody who wants to do this, that, and other. We poke them in there, you know, anything. It's a body. We used to say, and we were talking about child care earlier, and this came to my mind then, you're always so desperate in child care for house parents. Someone asked one time, what's the qualification of house parents? And somebody grabs somebody else's wrist, they do have a pulse. Or they're breathing. Because you were so desperate. The, back in those days, I doubt it's changed a lot. The life expectancy, <laughs> the burnout rate was about nine months as a house parent. So there was a constant effort to find people to do those things. So, you know, if you don't watch out, you just push anybody in there because after all we're to teach and we need teachers and we've got this classroom back here and it needs filling after all we built a classroom there must be a teacher in it well all right who are we going to get any meeny miny mo let's get sue she don't know <laughs> or she'll go that's usually the way it works she'll go we push anything off on her but that's not the way these scriptures sound one of them is saying you, will, you might not be in the mess you're in and falling away. If you'd used your time to study the Bible, you would be teachers. Instead, somebody's got to take you and walk you along. Teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. On the other hand, don't be too quick to want to teach. Are you sure you know what you're talking about? What is wrong when it comes to being a teacher or telling somebody, do you really understand that? The Ethiopian eunuch didn't have a big problem with saying, I don't know. Somebody tell me. And he was a man of great power. That man could easily have a great deal of pride. And here was somebody out there on his chariot. I don't know who that person is. He could have said. And Philip's out there, sent down by the Holy Spirit, doing what the Holy Spirit to him uh, told him to do regarding the Ethiopian unit, and says, do you understand what you're reading when he, word he, when he heard he was reading from Isaiah 53? I wonder, wonder what he was hearing when he heard him, but we don't have the record on that except he was reading from Isaiah 53. We know what part he was reading from because he asked it about it. Of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? And he began at the same scripture and preached them to him, Jesus. Could you do that? Do you know your Bible well enough to take the same scripture? Somebody just opens their Bible because it all fits. It's all the revelation of God's mind to us to lead us from earth to heaven. And then he turns over here to some passage and says, what is this talking about? And the person not even a Christian. Could you begin there and preach them to him, Jesus? But we must take the time. If we don't take the time, and if we don't hunger and thirst after righteousness, we won't. 
there must be that hungering and thirsting after righteousness. If you're too busy with everything else that's going on, and you don't hunger and thirst after righteousness, it means you want that as you would your necessary food, then you're not going to learn the Bible. You're just not going to do it. Because you see, the writer of Hebrews says, you're learning that so that you can use it to discern both good and evil. If you're just studying it, because you study it, <laughs> but not as God's mind put into your mind through your efforts because you want to be pleasing to Him so you're willing to use it to determine what's right and wrong. Yet all my life I've seen a host of people, they ask a question, you answer it a year later, they'll ask the same question. And they'll do that because they don't spend in-depth quality, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, desiring to do God's will in the study of the Bible. It's just a licking a promise and they're gone. I've read my Bible for the day. Even if I did, I might not have even done that. So when you think about these passages, the fact this is Wednesday night Bible study and our other times of study, your own personal study, be not many masters, for we shall receive the greater condemnation. And then for the time, you ought to be teachers. You have need again certain that you be taught again the first principles of the oracles of God. Good scriptures both aimed at different things, but they tend to dovetail right back around into one another. And have so much to say about why that we haven't developed in a lot of ways that we could. And thus, like the prophet of old, Hosea, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. If you're not a child of God this evening, the Bible teaches you must, with all your heart, believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. John 8, 24, Romans 10, 17. Having believed in Christ, you must repent of your sins. Acts 17, 30. Then you're to confess your faith in Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10 and verse 10. And you're to obey your Lord, that is, act upon the authority of the New Testament and being baptized into Christ for the remission or forgiveness of your sins. Acts 2, verse 38, 22, 16, 1 Peter 3, 21, Romans 6, 3, and 4, and so on. I've said it so often, more than that God doesn't require of you. Less than that you cannot do and become a Christian. And as a child of God, if you sin. You need to confess those sins. And the reason why is that you've already repented of it in your mind. And you're confessing the church. You've already straightened that up. And you want the church to pray for you. So that's what we're thinking about. And that's the reason we sing a song like we're about to sing. To encourage people who want to respond to the gospel truth. And so we urge you to do so while we stand and sing.